Thank you, Mark. Mac McCormick is a longtime member and continuing key figure in Norfolk W4AX. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> His expertise in ham radio, including software defining radio, is well known, if not legendary. Mac's very busy uh, international schedule often precludes club meeting attendance, so we're very fortunate to have Mac here tonight. Please welcome Mac McCormick. Before I end. Is this uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, did it come on plug? Did you turn it on? Yeah, plug. Turn it on. Oh, one, two. All right, that's a little better. Hey, good evening, everyone. And boy, it's great to be back uh, with familiar faces and some new faces as well. Uh, so, long history with the club. Uh, Jim, Jim uh, Stafford and I, uh, you know, when we first started this thing, or uh, just after we first revived it, Took the club from about 20 to 30 members to about uh, 275 members. And um, so I, I've had the honor of serving as the vice president president of the club. And it certainly, I can promise you I'll get active again in about 10 months. I haven't told my company yet, please don't. <laughs> but uh, in about 10 months, I'm going to hang it up and, and uh, let uh, those of you still working support me for a change. <laughs> and so uh, just to give you an idea of how much I do travel, uh, not that I'm proud of it, but just of why I haven't been at the meetings. Just this year, I've already flown 600,000 miles to 32 countries and uh, headed out again on Sunday, and I'll be going completely around the world again. So it's all over Asia and Europe and, and the U.S., and that's why I'm not here. My goal was to see if I can work DFCC by being there in person. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we'll see how that works. I'm pretty close right now. Uh, I haven't been to North Korea. I know you need it. I could probably do like that uh, pirate did and get, go offshore to that one, one place and, uh, and work all those people and hopefully I uh, wouldn't get caught. I need North Korea too, by the way. All right. Uh, so, um, you know, I thought I would just start off with a um, sort of an overview of things. I'm going to talk about a flex radio automated station tonight. This applies to how you would fully automate your station. And a lot of you say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, I'll, I'll explain why, and I'll show you why, because there's, as you'll see as I go through this, uh, you know, I do it sort of both ways. So as, as we look at this, I've been a ham in January, I will have been a ham uh, 50 years. So quite a while as a continuously licensed ham radio operator, and I really love it. But you're looking at some of the pictures in my shack that are vintage photos, and I don't know how many of you remember getting into ham radio back in, in my day, uh, you know, I started with an ARC-5 military transmitter uh, using crystals at that time in CW and a BC-348 receiver. And it was, uh, it was the most exciting thing in the world I can remember, at making my first CW contact at five words, five words a minute. Well, things have changed. You're seeing some pictures from my shack, and I'm going to try to do an open house in December for those of you that haven't been there, those of you that have that would like to come out and check things out in person, you'll see a lot of vintage equipment there. And the reason I operate vintage equipment is I believe in the yin and yang of ham radio. So work the latest and greatest stuff on one side, and then work the really old stuff on the other. You even see a K3 there, which I count as a vintage piece of equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and I was little swipe at all craft, sorry, I couldn't, couldn't help it. Uh, but you'll, you'll see, I, I use paper logging I, uh, when I'm on the vintage equipment. I don't use any automation at all. Uh, I've restored it all. Most of it came with no paint and certainly did not work electronically. So I have a great passion around bringing this vintage equipment back to factory standards uh, as it left the factory. And I can tell you this, it worked the last time I turned it on. <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't mean... Uh, you know, all of its tube, except for maybe the Elecraft. Uh, and so, um, you'll, you'll also see, uh, you know, there was a lot of AM equipment, amplitude mod modulation equipment. If I use a term someone's not familiar with, just wave your hand at me. But that was the original form of voice communication. 
And the reason I, I do so much of that is I'm not sure this new fangled single side band stuff is going to catch on. <laughs> so I, I want to be sure I'm prepared for, for whatever. If the, uh, if the big one ever hits, if North Korea ever does their thing, I don't know that I want to talk to anybody, but I suspect I can uh, with some of this vintage equipment. Some of it's quite large. You saw a BC-610 in there. That was the big unit. It stands about that tall. 650 pounds. Imagine this was carried by two men in World War II. They made real men in World War II. Uh, two men in World War II that would, that would lug this thing uh, into the back of a truck or whatever. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of vintage equipment there. It's a lot of fun to operate. And it is the, it is the purest form of ham radio operation, I would say. But having said that, what I'm going to talk to tonight is on the totally opposite end of that continuum. I'm going to talk about how you can have a fully automated station. As I'll show you in a moment, and I'll do a little demo of, of what it looks like from, uh, from operating remotely. Uh, you can um, do all of the station control from just using your radio. No computer, just using the radio. You can control everything in the shack, and I'll show you everything I'm controlling to give you an idea of what is possible. So please, for those of you that say, well, why would I ever want to do this? I do it for two reasons. One, because it's a technical challenge, and I enjoy technical things. And two, because it allows me, as someone who DXs a lot in contest when I can, it allows me not to focus on the radio at all, but to focus on the contact and make, th make uh, contacts instantly. So what I'm going to show you is the purest form of that automation. Uh, this would be a Flex Radio 6500. This one has no automation, but with this and a simple knob that, uh, that you can purchase, you can, you can control the radio, you can control the amplifier, etc. And that's the purest form of operating. But if I look at the fully automated station, that's here, dog not included. Uh, there is, um, uh, she's my plus size model. Anyway, um, the, um, she is actually a good runner. She ran six miles with me today. Uh, but this is the fully automated station, and I'll show you how this operates, but with one click on a spot or anywhere on, uh, a, uh, on the band scope, everything tunes automatically, and I'll explain what everything is in a moment. It may seem a little overwhelming, but if you build it up uh, sort of from the bottom, uh, it, it, you know, it sort of all comes together. You know, I was telling someone at dinner, I have um, more than two miles of LMR 600 cable in the ground. And to run all of that equipment you saw, there are more than 500 mostly handmade cables to connect everything together. So it's a, it's a lot of work to put a station like that together. But once it's built, it works quite well. In fact, they're using it at Mill Springs Academy this week, as they have for the last two years for the school round up in the air. Maybe I'll ask a couple of people to give a testimonial on that. If you have questions, I'm okay with you interrupting me. So if you, if you want to ask anything. Well, this is the wiring diagram for the automation. So a little overwhelming. I'm going to take you through each piece. But just by, by way of explanation, you see it's all controlled from a flex radio. You have a solid state legal limit amplifier here. You have all of the band switching here and filters and tuners that are not needed because all the antennas are resonant. You have a stepper antenna controller to keep it on frequency. You have amplifiers and transverters for 2 meters, 222 and 902. With this station, with a click of a button, I can operate from 160 meters to 902 megahertz just by clicking the button. And everything switches automatically. Antennas, everything. And I'll, I'll continue to explain what that is. And then you see some of the relay control boards and the ability to do D-Star and, and, um, and, and digital HF, etc. So this is the way it would be configured within the radio. It's pretty simple to configure if you know a bit about it. But you just set up each of the devices that you want. You type those in yourself. Uh, you tell it what type of data it needs and then you just enable it. And then that, that station then runs over a USB cable out of the back of the radio to control that piece of equipment. 
It's just that simple. So the goal for me is that I didn't want to have a computer running in the shack unless I was logging. I wanted everything to be run when I'm remote, as I am so much as you just heard. I wanted it all to be automated and run just from powering on the radio. Does that make sense? Everybody follow with me so far? Is this about the right level of detail for you? Go up some, down some? Okay, good right here? All right. So let's start where it all begins at the RF. And I'll show you this. So uh, presently there are three towers I've put up. Um, and there are 19 antennas on my property. Uh, combination of receive and transmit to be able to, uh, to accomplish this. And so about to be a fourth tower probably in December. Hopefully I get it up before we did the, uh, the open house. Uh, but uh, my wife loves them. She thinks they're beautiful. No, I'm just kidding. She, she really does. But I did tell her this year I would hang Christmas lights like a Christmas tree off of that one so she could, uh, so she could make it to a Christmas tree for Christmas. LED Christmas lights, yeah. yeah. That would be the deal. So it starts there. This is a seven bay in Mosley, and it has a two meter, 19 element beam on top. These are the VHF, UHF antennas. I'll talk about those in a minute, but two meter, 220, 440, and 900 megahertz. Those are all high gain antennas uh, that you see there. Of course, it's all on a rotor. And this is a step IR and an 80 meter uh, inverted V. There are other antennas for 160, 80. There's also an eight circle active receive array, which is a pretty, pretty sophisticated antenna where you can directionally receive on 160 and 80 meters just by either pushing a computer key or, or rotating a switch. And uh, it really helps you have a competitive advantage on 160 meters and 80 meters. And that sits way back away from the RF. This is on about, uh, I guess about eight acres <coughs> is, is where this antenna is set up. If you wonder where I live, I live south of Ball Ground between Canton and Cumming. So, and I moved out of an HOA where many of you have been before, right here near Alpharetta, where I did not have this. And one of the reasons for moving was one, to get out of Fulton County, and two, uh, to be able to do stuff like this. Uh, this is where it all comes in. It looks a little more messy than it is, but everything comes in. This is where all 19 antennas come in. They go through a switching mechanism here. Everything has lightning arresters on it, and it's all disconnected in case of, uh, you know, just with one switch I can disconnect it all. Uh, but that's, that's where it all comes in uh, to the shack, and that's a common grounding panel. It's pretty sophisticated grounding I put in to tie back into the service entrance and around the shack and back out to the towers, etc. Trying to follow best grounding practices to prevent lightning problems. I've had a direct strike at my old house. I didn't want another one here. These are the two, two of those because they're uh, with radio. Uh, you know, there's two antenna inputs, or actually more than two, but two that I use simultaneously. But the tuner stays in bypass 99% of the time. The only time it has to go out of bypass is when I'm on 80 and 160 in the higher portion of the phone band uh, because the antennas aren't resonant there. But most of my work when I'm contesting and DXing is CW, and so it's, um, it's, it's not needed there, but it's there if it's needed. So they, they rarely turn on. Um, everything's monitored through an LP500 so that I can you know, monitor power and SWR, etc. Uh, able to do that uh, remotely if I need to and be able to see what's happening in terms of station output power. This is the prototype of the Power Genius XL antenna uh, tuner, uh, gosh, amplifier <laughs> that you may have seen uh, in, in a QST recently. Uh, I'll have the actual one uh, at the end of this month and it um, but this is a prototype and I've been using it quite a while. So it's legal limit, tooth legal limit plus. Uh, when it's tested, and I've tested this at 2,000 uh, 2, watts keyed down for 24 hours. And it, uh, it just holds up. There's no other solid state amplifier that will do that. You had a question?
What's the question? I'll, I'll repeat it. Okay. The question is, question is, why is there a copper grounding plate at the antenna entrance? I don't know if I'll go all the way back. And the reason is, uh, you want to have a common ground field for as much equipment as you can. And the run from that copper grounding plate is over number four copper wire, you know, pretty, pretty big, directly about less than five feet out to the surface panel ground entrance where it goes to Georgia Power. So that the, the, the path to ground all that, that's, that's the first place RF's likely to come in, uh, yeah, lightning's likely, likely to come in, uh, is right there and it has the shortest path back to ground. But you want a common ground plane it's called for all of those connectors. Does that help? Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, this is a prototype, as I said. Uh, you can see a, yes, over here. Yeah, is Flex going to start shipping that next month? The question is, when's, ship, when's Flex going to ship that? Um, I guess by full disclosure, I'm not a Flex employee. I am a Flex fanboy. And because of my day job, um, you know, where I run a multi-billion dollar uh, global company, um, Flex uses me to advise them on business. I have really intimate details. I'm going to tell you the, the public answer, and if you see me privately, I might tell you the private answer. But, but the public answer is, I will have one in my shack that you can come see within the next two weeks. The public will begin seeing them very soon after that. Is that, is that good enough for you? Well, why don't we talk privately, uh, otherwise I could tell you okay. what, what's going on. I'll just tell you very briefly, since the question was, he's been on a waiting list forever. Uh, the reason is, it, you may or may not know this, but electronic components worldwide, I suffered this in my professional business as well, have been an extremely short supply, certain components, FPA, FPGA chips, certain capacitors, et cetera, even resistors. And they're in such short supply that people have started buying any they can find and marking them up a thousand percent to try to resell them. It's not that the, the parts are out of business, it's that they can't manufacture them quickly enough to overcome uh, the commodities market that it is. And so um, the reason it's taken a while longer is not because of any technical reason but because the manufacturers can't get parts quickly enough. What Flex has done on all their radios is they bought a one-year supply of parts. But to get those parts out of the factories in China and Taiwan, it's taken a lot of work to get those parts out. And it's not just Flex that's affected. My business at HP is affected. There are hundreds of businesses where this affects, just to let you know what's going on on the global economy. Okay. Um, this just gives you an example of what you see on the on the computer screen. It's all integrated into the software, so that you see it. It's all it's all controlled by the software. Uh, the nice thing about it is it can operate two bands at legal limit simultaneously. So you can be on 40 meters and 20 meters. Uh, you can be doing what's called single operator two radio, bouncing between those two bands, and it it's the same as having two amplifiers. For me, this replaces an Alpha 9500 tube amplifier and an Acom 2000 tube amplifier and it saves me $7,000 by using one amplifier. So there's a huge, huge cost savings for me. These are the bandpass filters that are in use. These are, um, are used to provide isolation when you're on two different bands at the same time. These are pretty, pretty high-end bandpass filters. They're all automatically controlled. Um, they're about uh, $1,200 a piece. I don't tell you that in the sense of, gosh, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But in the sense that with the new flex radios that are coming out uh, this month, uh, you no longer have to have those bandpass filters. So I'll be selling them if anyone's in the market. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Please let me know. Um, but anyway, uh, bandpass filters, what they do is they keep all your um, transmitted, uh, all your received emissions within a certain band so that if you're on 40 meters listening and, and 20 meters listening, you don't have any attenuation. So for example, let's say I'm working on 40 meters and uh, 
what they call running and I want to spot on 20 meters. If I send a signal on 40 meters, it would blank out whatever you'd hear on 20 if you didn't have a bandpass filter because the antennas are too close. You'd have to put them a couple miles apart at legal limits. And so this bandpass filter keeps the signal so that I can actually hear both signals at the same time even when transmitting the legal limit on one band, on any two bands. That's what they look like wired in. You can just see some of the cables back there. Um, and then this is all being run by the Flex 6700. And I'll show you in a moment a little demo, assuming everything works all right. can operate eight bands simultaneously uh, at 14 megahertz per band. So what that means is if I choose to, I can watch essentially all the hand bands at the same time. Or, for example, for those of you that operate six meters, you know there's six meter openings typically in the spring and summer. I can always keep a pan adapter open on six meters, 50.125, and I can see if there's any transmissions and know that six meters is open. Or maybe I just want to monitor the club repeater, 145.47. I can keep a pan adapter open on two meters and monitor the, uh, the club repeater while operating on any other combination of bands. Before the end of the year, maybe early next year, but planning before the end of the, of the year, I'll be able to assign those eight receivers to friends. In other words, if Chuck, AE4CW, I'll get to your question, if Chuck, AE4CW, uh, can't hear a station, and I can, I can let him, I can share that receiver with him over the internet, and he can control it as though uh, he were listening to it. There's a ton of other technology that's coming around that. Your question, sir? Yes, sir. So those are capabilities of the 6700? Correct. Okay. Correct. And then below that, you see a uh, Green Heron rotor controller. And the reason I chose Green Heron is one of the great rotor controllers. There's <laughs> presently three rotors up. Uh, that's the unit down here. Uh, but this is also computer controlled. So for, from the Mill Springs Academy, They've been spinning my antennas around today. I think they're just seeing how much, how many times they make it go around. <laughs> but uh, they've been spinning my antennas around today, and all that's computer controlled from, from wherever you are in the world. And the reason that's important is they're directional antennas, and you want to be able to point at whatever station you're trying to work. So let's talk about. Uh, this is Spot Collector from DX Labs. It's a free piece of software and I recommend it. If I click on that spot in yellow, if I double click on it, what happens to the station is everything changes automatically. It selects the correct antenna. It selects the correct bandpass filter. It changes the linear amplifier to the right frequency. It adjusts the tuner if it's required on that band automatically. It um, it sets the correct mode within the software, whether that's ready or sideband, whatever the mode happens to be. Uh, it uh, populates the call sign uh, in the software, etc., so that everything is set up. So I don't have to do anything but either grab a CW paddle or pick up a microphone or using a headset, just operate the station. And that was my goal here, not to have to do a bunch of knob twiddling. I love knob twiddling. Those of you that like that, there are a bunch of knobs in the beginning. I showed you that so you don't think I'm all the way over here. But when you're contesting or working high pressure DX like uh, uh, Bouvet coming up, believe me, you don't have time to twiddle a bunch of knobs if you want to work them quickly. So that's, that's the goal of this station. So the step IR tunes, uh, that's the, the tunable antenna, it tunes automatically, it's always resonant one to one. And all of this happens within about one second. So that it's click and you're there. And that was the goal of this station. And the important thing for me is not to have to run a computer in the shack to do this. If I power on the radio and the peripherals, and I do that all over a uh, web-based switch, AC power strip, if you will. I just send a, a command, I just touch a button on a, on, a, on a user interface, and it powers the whole station on. So I can power it on when I'm, when I'm in these. I, I travel over the last three or four years, I've been to about 156 countries for my job, 
it, in any of those countries, I can power it on and operate uh, either DX on, you know, when I'm there, or talk to my friends. Question, Mike. Please. You showed the uh, antenna rotor mm -hmm. control. But in that list, it doesn't say anything about turning the rotor. That's yeah, so, happening as well. So the question is, it doesn't show anything about turning the rotor. So think about this, Steve, that's a great question, and I get asked that a lot. Think about turning the rotor. The only thing a radio is going to give you is frequency information. It's not going to give you the azimuth information. The way the rotor turns automatically is when you click on the spot, it does the, it looks up the station location, it says it's at azimuth 243, and it automatically turns the rotor to 243. So clicking on the spots, what actually What does it? Because think about it, the radio only has frequency information. It doesn't, it doesn't know, if you're on 14.243, it doesn't know where you are. The radio doesn't. Right? Yes, sir? That device with a spot connector, like, electrical Mm -hmm. Collector. What about it? I was to oh, spot collector. C O L L E C T O R. The the software suite is called DX Labs. Delta X Ray L A B S. It's free. It is super uh, comprehensive. Uh, you might need a little help to get it set up, depending on your experience. The online support community is phenomenal. I recommend it. I don't believe. Ham Radio Deluxe is great about putting any of them down. Everyone has a, has a function. But uh, I, I believe for a free piece of software, uh, even for a paid piece of software, I don't think there's anything more powerful. Since you showed us that picture again, that's all is your UHF, VHF. That's all UHF, VHF, Daryl. Yeah. Uh, that tower is 60 feet. Yeah, so in December I'll put up 140 feet of Rome uh, 45 tower, and I may move some stuff around. Yeah, that's 60 feet. And it, if you notice, I have all of those vertically polarized, if you're familiar with horizontally polarized versus vertically polarized, and I do that, frankly, so I can work the repeaters around here. The two meter antenna you saw on top of the big tower is horizontally polarized so that I can work sideband and CW on two meters. Yes, sir. What's your base elevation? My base elevation, 902 feet, approximately. So, so, a couple of questions, Steve. Do you, do you still do all your own climbing? I still do all my own climbing, yeah. So I'm not uh, quite I'm not quite beyond that. I'm, I'm still pretty active. I'm still running about uh, 80 miles a, a month or so in, on heavily wooded trails. So I'm, I'm still getting along OK. I do have my wife come out and watch, so that at least she can say what happens. If I, but I'm a pretty careful climber. For those of you that have climbed with me, I did used to do all the climbing for the club up on all the water towers and and uh, Sweat Mountain and everything. I'll get back to doing that for you guys as soon as I can get retired. But um, anyway, as long as it's under about 1,500 feet, I'm good. <laughs> so. Uh, all right, uh, and now we'll look at the VHF UHF side. This is the two meter power amplifier. Gives you 100 watts on two meters, sideband, CW, and FM. And uh, it's all fully automated. It's a down east microwave, which if you're into high frequency stuff, I strongly recommend if you don't know about it, you check out, you'll hear it called DEMI, Down East Microwave Incorporated, I believe it stands for, out of Florida. <coughs> they take a while to build them, like maybe three to five months but it's the best, best, best kit you can get. And of course, what would a fully automated station be without a call sign light? So <laughs> whenever I transmit, as a result of the full automation, the call sign light is on. You say, well, why do you need a call sign light? I guess two reasons. One, it was a gift. And two, so when my wife comes down and wants to talk to me when I'm on the radio, I can just point at the light and she knows, uh, she knows that, uh, that I'm on the air if she can't hear me talking. Does she ever override the light? No, but sometimes when I see her coming, I'll just step on it. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it, it has some useful purposes. No, I've, I've known my wife since she was 14, 
and we get along really, really, really well. We've been together a long time. You know, I'm from Alabama originally. She was my first cousin, so it worked out really well. <laughs> so, it's funny, you know, I'm sorry to diverge here, but just hear Neil speak. You know, Neil and I are always commenting that Neil's father, my, my real name is Edward, and real, Neil's real father's name, oh, not real father, his only father, <laughs> Neil's father's name was Edward, and his mother, my wife's name is Adelaide, uh, which is an old southern name, and Neil's mother's name was Adelaide, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> and we're not related. <laughs> <laughs> Neil's my brother from another mother. <laughs> so. Anyway, um, so uh, you know it, it all uh, ties together back through the Flex 6700. I'll uh, show you a demo uh, now, but before I do that and switch over to to my iPad to show you, uh, there's a technology that Flex has released. I don't recall when, maybe just before Dayton. That's when it was. Uh, called SmartLink, and this is where you can have your radio on the internet with your old private credential. And you see several radios there where people are sharing credentials. And you tap on that radio from anywhere in the world, and you're connected to it. You don't have to fiddle with IP addresses and all that other nonsense. You just touch the radio when you're connected, and that's the way I operate. So I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment, how that operates. And with that, before I do the demo, well, let me do the demo, then I'll take any final questions you have. Can we switch uh, over to the iPad, please? Okay. Thank you. Give it a Sorry if I'm blocking you here. You want the light on or off? It's up to you, whether you can see it or not. It didn't, uh, it didn't come up. This worked in the test. Maybe it's working now. Did it come up? Remember, technology is always perfect. All right, here we go. No? Yeah. There it is. See, it's, it's an iPad, it's an Apple product, that's the problem. Right? <laughs> I've got a lot of Apple stuff. I've got a lot of Apple stuff. And, and Linux, so I'm, all right, I'm cool. But I just thought I'd take a swipe at Apple, like I did all the crap. All right, this is the application down on the bottom. If you see down on the bottom right, it says Smart SDR. I'm going to tap on that, and if everything works, if the tech gods are working, my, we'll be able to see my radio and others. So as I tap on that, it just says tap to connect. I tap on that, and it says you're not connected to the internet. All right. So let's see. I've got my hotspot on. Let me turn it off and back on. You know, when Apple has trouble with their demos, I don't feel too bad. If you watch the last uh, last review, let me go out and see if I've got a. It's, a open, connection. it's an open connection here if you want it, Matt. Is it? Yeah. So just look for what's available and you'll find it open, no it's password. Not very fast. It's not very fast. Well, this works. This was working. So let me try it and see if we can get to it again. It's up now. It's up now. <clears throat> and so if you look down on the bottom, these are all the radios that I could connect to. Uh, there are radios around this one up in Canada, and this is one... Uh, in Cedar Creek, Texas, one in Austin. I don't know where, oh, this is uh, in at the Plex Radio System headquarters, Cypress Creek, Texas. Sometimes you'll see 20 or 30 in there when the radios are turned on. Uh, out of courtesy of the others, and I can see whether they're busy or not by the little color of the ball on the left. I'm going to touch my radio. So, sorry I don't have speakers on here. But, but I'm able to, uh, to now, I'm on 20 meters, I'm on 14.294, I'm able to quickly. This is uh, schools of, well, let me 
You know, this this might be a little problem. I didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> My glasses are back there. Anyway. Thanks, thanks, Chuck. Anyway, you could see that uh, I'm instantly on 20 meters. Everything is tuned automatically. Thanks. That was going to be a disaster, wasn't it? <laughs> Everything is tuned automatically on the sideband, all the amplifier and everything. If I were to push the push to talk button, let's see if we can talk to them. Sorry, I was waiting on her to, to say she's done because I can't hear the other station. All right, Victor Echo 7, X-ray repertory. Thank you. Whiskey 4 Alpha X-ray. Whiskey 4 Alpha X-ray. Thank you, Miriam. You're 59 in Atlanta, Georgia. Appreciate you having uh, schools on the air. 73, W4AX. What's your state? State is Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia, over. All right, thank you. 73. 73. Okay. Anyway, you could see that you could be anywhere in the world and do that. We just worked her 1,500 watts. Uh, didn't ask you look which way the antenna was pointing, but I, we could have turned it. it I, I could tell she was strong enough. But if we just touch the frequency, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. Let's go down to... Uh, So we just switched to um, 160 meters. You noticed it was instantaneous. All the antennas and everything switched. And so on CW. And so if I wanted to, I could operate them on CW, etc. But he's in a QSO. So with that, let me turn the volume down. How do you do CW with the iPad? How do you do CW? Yeah, sure. The iPad. Well, uh, there's a couple of different ways, but the easiest way to do it is to, uh, let me get in CW mode here. I didn't actually change the mode for this. Let me uh, change to CW. And let me uh, get over here. And then if we go over here to CWX, should have changed. Why aren't I seeing CWX? Oh, here it is, up at the top. So if I type in CWX, I can have pre-programmed F keys, like if I'm working a D-Expedition or something, like press F1, it sends your call sign, press F2, it sends 5NN, thank you, TU. Or you can type here. If you notice when I do that, you could use a keyboard as well. You can type to send CW. Alternatively, there is a way to look at that. Okay, that is a uh, fully automated flex station. I tried to show you the yin and yang of, uh, of radios tonight. Uh, you're all welcome for a shack visit when I'm around. And again, if I can pull it off, I'll, I'll do an open house in December. And uh, I, my wife always cooks a big breakfast of pancakes and bacon and sausage and stuff. So it's, if you don't like the shack, you can always come up and eat. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Thanks.
Neil's question is, when the 6400 coming, I'll have my 6600, I talked to Flex today, within the next two weeks. You'll get yours probably about six months after that. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, you'll get yours soon. Because you have friends in low places. <laughs> when you pick your pockets in the Tucker and Robbery, did you go out and look for a low noise place first? So the question is, should I look for a no, low noise place when I look? Uh, the truth is, to get my wife to move out there, because there's no street lights or anything, she picked the property. Mm -hmm. But what I did is, before I sort of said it's okay with me, is I did take antennas out there and put them up and listen. And it is a very low, I don't know what the noise floor was sure. there. Yeah. The, noise, the noise floor is very very quiet there. Yeah. And um, Well, I, I, I lived in, I mean, I didn't live three miles from here, you know. I mean, so it was certainly noisy there. But, it's, you know, my closest neighbors probably, I don't know, 600 yards away or something like that, you know. No electric fences, no big power lines. Yeah, a couple of questions over here, yes sir? The SmartLink software, does it, uh, does it route you directly to your radio or does this go through a service that Flex is providing? So the question is, does the SmartLink, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Uh, some people didn't. The SmartLink software, does it go directly to your radio or does it go through a router? So the, the technical explanation behind it is the SmartLink server resides on uh, Amazon Web Services. Okay. And so the only thing that happens is when you touch that button, an encrypted link goes up to Amazon Web Services, which knows where your radio is. In other words, that's all registered with it one time, just one time with Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services says, this guy's over here on this IP address, maybe it's Bangkok where I'll be next week, and the radio's here, you guys talk to each other and then it's out of the way. Okay. It's only for the initial negotiation. Handshake. What's uh, the Tim, Tim had a question first, sorry. I just want to know what kind of uh, dummy load did you use when you held that 2K dummy load? I have a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a Palstar 5K uh, dummy load. How did you keep it from getting so hot? Well, it's five kilowatt dummy load. Plus, it's got fans in it to, to cool it. So, you know. <laughs> Quite a question here that I'm confused. The, uh, the interface that, that had the other radios listed. What's the purpose of those other radios? If you wanted to connect to someone else's radio. Okay. Is it a user name password kind of? It is. There's, there's, you can do it with Google. You can do it with Facebook. You can do it with username and password. Uh, you know, however you however you choose to set it up. For example, Mike W5JR, a good friend of mine, he and I share radios a lot. Uh, I have antennas he doesn't have, and maybe he hears something he wants to operate, and I just say that's cool. You know, obviously you aren't going to share it with everyone, because you don't know who's operating your, your radio. Uh, but I, I do that with a few people. And what you saw there is is the Flex Radio uh, sort of insiders that are where we test stuff. Steve, and then Neil? Do you remotely disconnect and reconnect antennas, or is it rigged so that if you're not using the radio, it automatically disconnects the antennas in case of that lightning stuff? The question is, do I remotely disconnect antennas in case of lightning uh, if the radio is not being used? The, the short answer is, the only way to disconnect the antennas is when I kill the power to the station, it disconnects the antennas. That's one button on a web browser. I have to do that. I can show you if you want to see it, but it's one button on a web browser. There were a couple other questions. Neil? Uh, it's more of a statement. I How will admit you? that I resisted flex Ooh. because I had to have knobs to turn and twirl. I'm sorry. I'm an old hand. But I ordered a maestro, which I think you saw in the pictures. It came uh, a week ago. I thought it was absolutely the coolest thing to be sitting in my lounge chair upstairs in my den with my dog in my lap and the maestro in front of me and I'm into AE4CW system while I'm sitting there and listening, I'm not transmitting yet, but listening. The manual that came with the maestro, you've all heard the expression RTM, read the manual. 
it is 187 pages. This is not something you don't read. But to me, I, I had to call Matt right away and say, Matt, this is absolutely the slickest thing in the world to be sitting here and into his, uh, Chuck Catlidge's system and tuning around using his antennas and his radio. That's great. I'll give you just a second. There was a question here. Kind of a dumb question. Hi, Gary. He's a Georgia Tech guy. So that's, that's why. I want to lower the level. Uh, when you turn the power off, you disconnect it, and your antennas go to ground. That's easy to say. Then you've got the a coax coming that somehow connects to your radio. How much of a separation is there actually there between what's going to ground and a relay connecting in some way? Is there how much of a gap is there in there? I know it's a very stupid sounding question, but I'm, but I'll give you two seconds of background. I have a rotary switch that goes to ground and that robs my antenna to ground. But I know we're contact wise, it's not very many millimeters away to a connection that goes into my radio. Being a poor person, I have a Yaesu FT3000. I'm not really, I'm unemployed now. I'm not really in a position to buy another one real quick unless Neil finds me a deal. So how much physical separation is there? How much of a gap would it have to happen if your antenna gets hit? Of course, Gary, you know what's an electrical engineer far better than I. If, if, if you get a direct hit on something, lightning can jump. Uh, you know, 100 feet or you know, 1,000 feet. So there's no amount of gap you're ever going to put in. So then probably pulling the coax off, and as we used to do in the old days, you used to tell us to put it in a mason jar. Like that would help. I, I don't use a mason jar, but I do disconnect it from my FT3000. When I go but, upstairs. So the, it, it's a normal high uh, <coughs> high current RF relay, uh, like a, a Toshiba or not to, not Toshiba, but the Dachi, yeah, Tahachi relay. I don't know how, what the gap is. The reality is, if I get a direct strike, nothing's going to protect me. Having said that, I've done some additional things, like at the, where the antenna. And the, and the uh, rotor cable and, and the step IR control cable, et cetera, on that antenna come in. There's a lightning arrestor right there that is at ground. The tower is fully grounded, CAD welded in three places around with number four uh, copper. And there's a number four piece of copper running back through the conduit back to the surface entrance. So everything, one of the things you want to do for lightning is have everything at a common point, right? You know better than I. And so I've taken every precaution I can, but I'm willing to risk the convenience of this for a direct strike. The reason I ask is you have an obviously a very fantastic, expensive system. And I figure when it came to not getting it destroyed, you wouldn't be, uh, how you say, uh, stupid. <laughs> so that's why I ask. Well, I don't know how stupid that is, but I've done my best. Yes, sir, back here, and then I'll come to you, John. Matt, given the circumstances where you're operating the system remotely or you're letting someone else operate the system remotely, who's the control operator? So the question is, who's the control operator? You know, there's been a lot of discussion on that. If you are a licensed ham, you're the control operator. It's just like I'm the call sign trustee for NF4GA and uh, K4JJ. And I let a lot of people in here operate it, but I'm technically, you know, the call sign trustee if there were a problem. So the FCC, if there was a problem, they would get out, not that they do this anymore, but they would get out their direction finding equipment and they would find my station and I'd have to somehow show that, you know, I wasn't actually operating, that another licensed team was. But I think if it ever came down to the letter of the law, you're responsible. So I only share it with people I trust and know that are, you know, Fine business operators. Lori? Quick question. In relation to sharing radios, um, am I understanding correctly that it is over the internet? So if you're using an SDR, does the other person also have to have an SDR? Or? Okay. So the question is if you're sharing a radio, it's SDR over the internet, does the other person have to have an SDR? Question, the answer is no. Anyone in here could. You can download the client for free. You can run on a PC, an iPhone, an Apple, um, a, a um, 
What else will it run? Android? <laughs> not Android. And I'll tell you why it's not on Android. If you know anything about Android, and I assume you know more than I, there are like six different major flavors, and none of them cooperate with each other. And getting the software to work across six different Android platforms is like writing six different OSs. And that's why it's not supported by Android. But the question is, if you had the client, you could operate any of those radios. So Chuck there has his laptop, and we were just doing this before the meeting. And from his laptop, he was able to connect to my station. Yes, sir. Uh, your, your station looks like 100% complete and perfect. It's so not. What's your next step? What's my next step? Uh, as I mentioned, I'll put up a 140-foot Rome 45 tower probably in December. And I'll put up uh, a uh, probably a, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about an 80-meter beam at 140 meters. How many and maybe a couple of other antennas that will hold it. Okay. 140 feet or meters? No, feet, sorry. I've been overseas too much, sorry. John. Gary, Gary, I was just going to give you the rest of the answer to the question, because I asked Matt the same thing about lightning protection. And it went on for a long time. At the end of the day, he looked at me and said, really good insurance. Yeah. <laughs> I bought mine from ARRL for about 150 bucks a year, and that's good. Daryl, give me the hook. You going to finish? <laughs> you're, you're good. All right. How many elements are you, you going to put up on 80? I thought it was six. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> probably Wait, pro probably, probably two or three. <laughs> probably two or three. <laughs> wow. I That's the breakfast. Point. I want to come see all of this. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have that up in December. I hear a lot of the extras are turning their beams upside down. A lot of the extras their beams upside down. I sometimes stand on my head, but I haven't tried turning my beam upside down. Australia? Yeah, I operate from Australia a lot. I've been there eight times this year, so I should, I should try that. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a DXCC to yourself? Do I? Am I DXCC? Well, no, to yourself. Like when you're, when you're <laughs> operating remote through a visitor station to yourself, I have done that. Yeah, I actually have. Yeah. I've operated from more than 150 countries. So, yeah. You operate radio? Yeah. Have I operated other radios? Yes. Radio to radio? Yes, you can do that. So sometimes I'll be on my iPhone in one and the iPad on the other talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun to talk to yourself. It's much better than what goes on in my head. <laughs> Yes, sir. Any QSOs with your system on commercial aircraft via their Wi-Fi? Uh, so, the qu did everyone hear the question? So, no, no, no. All right. Is it possible to do a QSO from a commercial aircraft on Wi-Fi? Well, Delta Airlines loves me. I've tried it. The bandwidth isn't high enough. <laughs> uh, so, no, I, 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 I've tried it. I, I wouldn't able to make it work. I, I've done it from the runway when you're still using cellular. Anything else? We'll, we'll take maybe two more questions. We'll wrap up here. <coughs> if you allow another operator to use your station, is there a log kept of which operator to use it from one time to what time? Okay, the question is if you, if you allow, if I allow Chuck, you know, Chuck uses my station. Bill Springs Academy has been using it for the last two days. Uh, is there a log kept? The answer is no. You just share it with people you trust. On a Flex 6500, if it's physically turned off, it's connected to a hot 12 volt supply, can you remotely turn it on? So the question is, can you remotely turn on a Flex 6500 if it's connected to a 12 volt supply? Um, that may be something that's not of interest to the whole group. I'll be glad to tell you. Right. Is anyone, do you want to hear the answer? I'll tell you if you want to know. The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> that's the short answer. Maybe I'll tell you how uh, when we finish here so I don't keep Daryl's meeting. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.